Well, today we're going to conclude, Lord willing, our huge series we've been doing on the names of Jesus the Christ. We've gone through, or we will by the end of the today, gone through 72 of his names, and this is not an exhaustive list. I want to say there are more names, and every time I'm opening the Bible and looking there, I see, oh, I forgot this one, I forgot that one, there's more, there's more. But there's so much on the, the wonder and glory of Christ and his great, great names. Let's start with the seventh one from this particular message called the stillness. And the seventh name is the Almighty, the Almighty. Let's turn together. Revelation, the first chapter. Why don't we stand together as I read it for us. Revelation, the first chapter. And I'd like to read starting with verse 4 and read on down through 8 as we study this for a few moments, the Almighty. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, I'm in verse 4 now, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and releaseth us from our sins by his blood. He's made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, say it with me, the Almighty, absolutely. You may be seated within God's magnificent word. Jesus Christ himself, himself, is fully, totally, actually the Almighty. Now, this passage we just finished reading is in the first person. In other words, Jesus is speaking it himself. So he's actually calling himself the Almighty. When people, and you might know one or a hundred or two hundred people, but when people take his name in vain, I'm talking about saying Jesus Christ, or in any kind of way, take his name in vain, they are actually, when they do that, biblically, invoking wrath. Are you aware of this? They're invoking wrath. Don't let it ever cross your lips, because there's punishment that comes within it. The third commandment, you know about the Ten Commandments, the third commandment, this is found in Exodus 20, you can run over there with me if you want to, but I'll just read it for us. In Exodus 20, we see the Ten Commandments, and this is one of the commandments, they don't all say this, but it's one of the commandments that actually has punishment right in the middle of the commandment. Exodus 20, verse 7, and I'll read you this one commandment. And this is strong stuff for our culture. It says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name 
in vain. Now you see the next one is talking about keeping the Sabbath, keep it holy, you shall, you know, it goes on and on about these different commandments. But this one, this one has punishment with it. He's not the sweet, innocent, gullible, lesser God. He's not. Jesus Christ is the Almighty. So, 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 when our president dares to use his name in vain, which he just did, there's punishment coming on him and the nation with him. He just finished saying, it was on an off mic, but he said he was glad it was a hot mic. He just finished, you heard this, right? He, he just finished saying, this is Biden, and I am angry about it. I admit I'm angry about a number of things, but this is one of them. He just finished saying, I'm going to meet with Netanyahu, and I'm going to bring him a come to Jesus moment. Now, that's vain. He's not leading him to Christ. It's got nothing to do with Christ. It's all politics. And so he uses my Savior and your Savior, right? He's using your Savior's name in vain. That's not good. And it will come with punishment on Biden and his administration and on our nation, I might add. Next one is crown giver, and this is a nice one. Christ Jesus is the crown giver. Lest you thought it was just going to be yours that you picked up when you got to heaven, you're going to just pick up your crowns and go about your way. No, 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 no. It says in Revelation 2, turn with me over there, running a lot of scriptures as usual. Revelation 2, that right towards the end of the Bible. In Revelation 2, verse 10, it says these words. Revelation 2, 10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. What a word to the church, right? Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Boy, is this happening worldwide in our brothers and sisters across the globe, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. I'll explain in a moment what that means to us. 10 days. Be faithful unto death. And that doesn't just mean getting martyred. It means until the end of your life. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So who is the crown giver? Jesus the Christ. He is the crown giver. These crowns, there's five of them, will be handed out at the Bema seat or the reward seat of Christ. The Bema seat, the reward seat of the Lord Jesus. Now it says here, you will have tribulation for 10 days. Let me just help us a little bit with this one. The number 10 is the number of totality. It's the number of fullness. So our testing or our tribulation or our trouble will be complete in the sense that there's a motive of Christ to complete you. You go, now, wait a minute. I came to Jesus when I just want a nice, happy life and hang out. This is my fire escape. I'm just going to hang out. No, 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 no. He is going to bring and allow testings, not temptation, but he's going to allow testing to come on you. He's going to allow testing to come to complete us, to tenday us. Does that make any sense to you? Okay, you're getting this, right? You say, well, I've never had any trouble. Well, hang out in Christ. You'll get some, right? But he will allow your tribulation to come. You'll have it for 10 days until we are complete. And by the way, if someone who's born again, you're listening to this, right? Resists Satan but also resists Christ and his work. Now, we're all familiar with resisting Satan, but we can also resist Christ and his work in our hearts, right? We can say, I don't know, that's a little much commitment for me. But you resist him and resist him, he will work to complete that 10 days, and you can resist, and I've seen this with so many people, until finally he takes you home. I've known so many people that were born again, and I'm quite convinced of it, 
but I would watch them resist the Lord again and again and again and again. And suddenly they were gone. God whisked them away. All right, your completion is with me, and he'll take you. Number nine, the potter. I love this one. The potter. Let's turn over to Jeremiah for the potter. There's a great story in Jeremiah. This is the Lord speaking to our brother, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 18, the first 10 verses, Jeremiah is told by the Lord to go down to the potter's house. So let's read the story. Here we go. Jeremiah 18, starting with verse 1. Let's stand again. Jeremiah 18, the war came to Jeremiah. From the Lord saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, Jeremiah 18, and there I shall announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. O house of Israel, at any moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot it, to pull down or destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, then I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plan it. Verse 10, if it does evil in my sight, by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. You may be seated within God's word. Jesus Christ is the great potter. He's forming nations, and he's also forming you. When it's spoiled, he'll remake it. Now, this is quite a word for nations, <laughs> whether it's the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the French, the Americans. This is quite a word for nations, but it's a word for us, too. When it's spoiled, in other words, when it doesn't come the way that he means for our life to be or our nation to be, he will remake it. That phrase is a very intense phrase, is I will think better. Mm. Look, you really don't want God to be thinking better <laughs> like he blew it when it comes to your walk with him. You don't want him thinking, ah, I guess I should have never brought her down that path because she's saying no and no and no. We need to say what? Yes, yes, yes to the Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, try it with me. Yes, Lord, absolutely. Tenth one. Oh, is this a doozy? <laughs> stone of stumbling, rock of offense. Is that one of Jesus' names? A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense? Oh, is it ever. Let's turn over to Isaiah. Isaiah 8, this is right before Jeremiah. A lot of Old Testament, a lot of New Testament. We mix it, as you know, the whole Bible. Isaiah 8, starting with verse 11. And this is one that Peter is going to quote here, and we'll go to that in a moment. But let's start with Isaiah. Isaiah 8, starting with verse 11. For thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me 
not to walk in the way of this people. Boy, is that a phrase for us. <laughs> not to walk in the way of Americans, right? Okay, we walk in the way of Christ. You're not to say it's a conspiracy in regard to all this people call a conspiracy. You're not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts who you should regard as holy. And he shall you fear. And he shall be your dread. Then you will become a sanctuary to both houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over. Now, Christ is the rock of offense. He's the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. But who is he talking about making us into? He's talking to have us be a rock to stumble over and a stone to strike and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many will stumble over them and they will fall and be broken they will be snared and caught. Very powerful scripture. This is the scripture that Peter's referring to. Let's turn over to that one. Peter, first Peter, there's three Peters as you know, but this is towards the end of the New Testament. First Peter, chapter two, verse six. Now Peter's in here. Quoting from the Isaiah scripture we just finished reading about. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. For this is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom, they are also appointed. Jesus the Christ is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. The word of God is offensive. We might as well settle that. It is. They don't like it. And when I say they, I'm talking pretty broad. I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about international religions, I'm talking about the culture, and I'm talking about the church. Ooh, what did he say? No, no, the church is always right. They got it all right down the line. Oh, no, they don't. Christ, his word, offense. It'll even offend you. You go, I don't want to hear that. That's not what I'm used to. Ooh. There are two great satanic muzzles. Muzzle across the mouth, gag, you can call it whatever you want, that has been put on you <laughs> and the church so you can't speak to sin. There are two muzzles. Now, I'm hit with this all the time, but I've been hit a lot with this. And I'm telling you, there are two muzzles, and those two muzzles are the love God and judge not. You are wrong to defend sin. You are wrong to take the side of the sinner. Do I need to be stronger than that? God hates the sinner and the sin. Otherwise, why Calvary? Why the cross? If he liked us the way we were before Christ, if he liked the sin, then he wouldn't have needed to go to the cross. But he did. 
People don't want to hear, people don't want to hear that there is a God that we must deal with and there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Now, I'm going to give you some words, and you can't imagine who would have said such an awful thing. He must have not really been with the culture. And here it is concerning hell. Their worm does not die. I'm quoting from Mark 9.44. Their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. That's concerning hell. Who would have said such an awful thing? Jesus Christ. Their worm, this is talking about hell, does not die. Ugh. You like worms? I, I don't like worms, especially if they're eating you. I mean, their worm does not die, <laughs> nor is the fire quenched. Tell you what, let's actually look at Matthew 7. Why don't we just look at Matthew 7 here for a minute? Because this is what's thrown in your face all the time, constantly thrown in my face. You can't judge, you can't judge. But let's look at what the Bible is actually saying. Let's look at Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, it says in verse 1, Do not judge, lest you be judged. They love to quote that part of the Scripture. For in the same way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure it shall be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye? Behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your eye. Here comes the part I want to talk about. Then, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls for swine lest they trample them. Under their, feet, under their feet and turn and rend you to pieces. So the whole motive of Matthew 7 is for us to be clean so we can judge. This is very important. He wants us to be the sword. He wants us to be the light. He wants us to bring conviction. No? But the way to do that is for us to be clean ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. I, I do get it more than you realize. Look at the scripture, from, or at least jot, jot down the reference. 1 Corinthians 6. At least jot this reference down so you at least have it somewhere the next time somebody this afternoon, because it won't take long, tells you you can't judge. Okay. Oh, really? I can't judge, huh? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2 and 3 says, says this, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church, the Corinthian church, which was so off the wall in so many ways, and he said these words, do you not know that the saints will judge, ah, oh, judge, the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more matters of this life? How much more matters of this life? Homosexuality, abortion, living together, lying, anger, I get it. How much more the matters of this life? Depression, I mean, I can go on and on. We're meant to judge. But the call is that we be clean, so our judgment is also coming with power and the sword, the muzzles, the love God, right? <laughs> Judge not, <laughs> right? Silence of the church has allowed the sludge of the culture to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. We can't say anything, so it gets deeper and deeper, right? But we need to, we must. Number 11, faithful and true witness. Oh, is he? Faithful and true witness. Let's look at Revelation, the third chapter. Revelation 3, faithful and true witness. Revelation 3, starting with verse 14, says these wonderful words. Now, 
When I say wonderful, I mean this is talking to Laodicea, which is the close of the church age. But nevertheless, in here we find the spectacular name of Jesus. Revelation three fourteen, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness. We just finished hearing that, right? Faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds. They're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The Greek is actually more <laughs> intense there than spit. It's, it's really gross. But anyway, the Lord means for us to recognize that he's the faithful and true witness, right? Faithful and true witness. And there's his name right there in Revelation 3. Now, in the middle of this lukewarmness, the Lord Jesus Christ is called faithful and true witness, but he's also wanting us to be the same. He's wanting us to be faithful and true witnesses. He's faithful and true, so should we be. So in the middle of the lukewarmness, in the middle of the last of the church age, the last stage, there's seven stages, and I believe this from Revelation 2, 3, and ending there because the church is never mentioned again in all of Revelation after the end of chapter 3, as you know, in the Bible. The church is never mentioned again. Why? Because she's gone. Anyway, she's with the Lord in heaven. But the end stage is Laodicea, and out of that end stage, there's a faithful and true witness. Now, this is part of the reason why I believe that the two witnesses of Revelation 11 come out of the church age, because here it is in the middle of Laodicea, it's talking about a faithful and true witness, and there's going to be a fantastic witness of these two during the tribulation. Everything about Christ is true, right? Everything about Christ is faithful. Has he been faithful to you? Oh, so faithful. We aren't always faithful to him, but he's been faithful to us. Would you be willing to say, I will be faithful and true to Christ? Let's try it. I will be faithful and true to Christ. You will? Who would say it? Several of you would. Why don't you say it with me one last time? I will be faithful. Come on. I'll be faithful and true to Christ. Absolutely. All right. Last name of our 72 is real clear. It's three letters. God. Again, we're working through, and we've now come up to our 72nd name of God. And this is the last one that I'll do, and I'll end with God as his name. Let's turn to Matthew, the first chapter. Very familiar scripture, but an important one because of how it ends. Let's look at Matthew 1, starting with verse 18. Matthew 1, 18, it's always read around Christmas time, and I think that limits it because I think it should be read often. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ is as follows. I'm in Matthew 1st chapter, verse 18. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name 
Jesus. By the way, that's the first time in the Bible his name Jesus ever mentioned. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. And all this took place. That that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, right? Saying in verse 23, and this is obviously quoting Isaiah again, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, capital S, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So what is Christ's name? God with us. Wow. Not one of his messengers, not a prophet. God with us. I want to give us from the Gospels a number of scriptures that talk about Jesus as God. Matthew, and again, these are from the Gospels, just the Gospels. It's in other places in the Bible too, but just the Gospel. Matthew 4, 7, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Everybody takes that, the Father in heaven. But who is Lucifer in the wilderness speaking at and to? and trying to tempt Jesus. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Matthew 5, 8 says they shall see God. Matthew 5, 9 says they shall be called the children of God. When we're sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're sons of God. You're getting this, okay? Matthew 6, 24 says you cannot serve God and mammon. And there's the choice. Matthew 12, 28, the kingdom of God is come upon you. <laughs> wow. Mark 1, 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. This is, of course, the Baptist speaking. Mark 2, 7, who can forgive sins but God only? And who does forgive sins? The Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely. Mark 12, 32 there is one God, speaking about the Lord there, Jesus. Luke 1, 47 says, rejoiced in God, my Savior. I mean, this goes on and on, right? Luke 9, 43, they were amazed at the mighty power of God. This is when Christ was doing so many of his miracles. Luke eleven twenty says, with the finger of God, absolutely. Christ was healing and moving and stilling the waters and walking on the water and turning the water into wine. I could do a whole message on the water. Nevertheless, it was by the finger of God. Luke 18, 43 says, they followed him glorifying God. Absolutely. John 1, 1 says the word was God. Absolutely. John 5, 18 this is the Pharisees, is you're making yourself to be equal with God, and he certainly was. <laughs> John 6, 33, the bread of God is he. Ah, oh, I'm sitting there thinking, what should I end this long series with? I mean, there's, you got a whole Bible, right? <laughs> what do you end 72 names of the Lord Jesus with? I chose Romans. Romans 16. Let's turn over there real quickly. Romans 16. Let me read a couple of verses for us. Romans 16, verse 20 says, And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel. That's the Apostle Paul speaking here. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God as made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.